educational in nature. This is Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. Only on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, you're listening to Yaron Brook filling in for Mike Opelka. I'll be here uh, through Thursday. He'll be back on Friday. And, uh, you know, uh, we ended up uh, we ended up the last uh, hour talking about immigration. Look, there are a lot of other issues to talk about in immigration, uh, which I'm not talking about, right? Uh, wh- what about mass migration? What about migration of Muslims? If you want, if you're interested in any of that, call in 888-900-3393. 888-900-3393. Uh, happy to talk about any of that or any of your other objections to immigration. Uh, but I want to shift topics, and I'm sorry Max has disappeared again. He keeps calling and dropping and calling and dropping. Come on, Max. Stick with it. Uh, but Max wanted to talk about the rise and fall of America, and and, um, and I do too. Uh, I, I want to talk about why we have this idea, which I think is, is real, that, that America is in decline. And I can tell you, you know, the difference between America as I imagined it when I first decided to come to America and between the America I found when I came was significant. And then the difference between America that I found when I came and the America that exists today, the America of the last 30 years, I, I came to America exactly 30 years ago, is significant. In my view, America is in decline. Uh, It's not gone yet. There's still America here, but America is in decline. And we have to define what we mean by America. And and this will connect a little bit to, to the president's comments from yesterday, particularly early on. We have to define what America is to really talk about rise and fall. And luckily for us, Max called back. All right. So, so Max, you want to you wanna lead us off here on this topic with, a, with some comments or a question? Yes. I just had a question. Sure. Do you, how, how long do you think until it actually gets to, uh, like, another world war? Because the way the U.S. is looking now, it's kind of like how Germany was. It used to be all, you know, it used to be a religious place and... A lot of good stuff there. Then, uh, you know, it fell down to Hitler. Yeah. But All to right. be honest, you know, Hitler really didn't do anything wrong. What's that? You, did you just say Hitler didn't do anything wrong? Yeah, he really didn't. Oh, Hitler was one of the most evil people in human history. He did everything he did was wrong. Everything he did was evil. No, he didn't. And uh, he, he, is, he is certainly one of the nastiest characters in, uh, in human history. Um, but as to how long before we have a world war or something like that, I don't know. I'm not in the business of predicting and putting timetables on things. I will tell you, we're in decline. Thanks, Max, for calling, although I didn't think you would be a supporter of Hitler. That, that I, I wouldn't have taken the call if I'd known that. Um, I, even I have my 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 uh, my limits, and uh, being a supporter of Hitler and being a supporter of Stalin, uh, 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 that's where you hit my limits uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of tolerance. But look, uh, uh, America is in decline. Whether it ends up in a world war, whether it ends up in just slow decline, or whether we just go into a massive depression, or whether we start killing each other, who knows? what it looks like, and I'm not even sure it has to end that way. I'm an optimist. I think the decline can be reversed. I think we can save this country, and I think there's certain signs in the culture that suggest that this country is, is still able to save itself. But I want to first try to understand what America is, what America represents, what America... When, when we say America, do we just mean this particular geography? Do we just mean the particular people who live here? I understand why people are hostile to immigrants. If you believe it's just the people who happen to live within these borders right now. Oh, they're not Americans. To me, America is much more than that. To me, America is an idea. An idea that was codified in this particular geographic area. An idea that was manifest in reality in this particular geographic area. And not by accident, but because of the existence of men of genius like the Founding Fathers, 
who created this country. This is their country, or at least the country I love, the America I love, is their country. And it's their ideas, their ideas about what a country should be like that is slipping away, that is disappearing, that is under constant attack. Here's, here's a, a, an example. This is from uh, Donald Trump's speech last night, right? And this is, this is, I think, very telling on what the right today has to offer Americans. Um, now, he, he, he talks about this, uh, you know, too often we forget that a wound inflicted upon a single member of our community is a wound inflicted upon us all. When one part of America hurts, we all hurt. And when one, when one citizen suffers an injustice, we all suffer together. Really? Is that true? I mean, I know that there are people hooting right now in America. I don't feel it. And I can't say necessarily I care. I mean, if they're good people, I care. If they're not so good people, I don't care. Just because they're Americans doesn't make me care. Is that what makes us American? Is the fact that we all have some, some kind of communal pain threshold that we all feel for each other, we have some kind of collective consciousness, and we all share in each other's experiences? Really? Is that America? Loyalty to our nation, he goes on, demands loyalty to one another. Love for America requires love for all of its people. Ugh, really? When we open our hearts to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice, no place for bigotry, and no tolerance for hate. Now, I agree that there should never be room for prejudice and never be room for bigotry. I'm not so big on this uh, everybody hates hate. I like to hate. There's some people who deserve my hatred. Hate is not a bad thing. It's so politically correct to say we must eradicate hate from our world. Really? I hate lots of people. I hate Noam Chomsky. Some of you might not know who he is, but he's, a, he's, he's the most cited, I think, intellectual in America today. A, a, a leftist, nihilist, really bad guy. I hate him. I hate Hitler. I hate Stalin. I hate a lot of people out there who advocate for really bad ideas. Yeah, I hate them. Don't be, don't be, uh, don't be embarrassed by your hate. Don't be ashamed of your hate. If you hate people for good reason, if you hate people for rational reason, then hatred is not a bad thing. So I hate this politically correct nonsense about we must eradicate hate from America. No, I, I hate, I hate Islamic terrorists. I hate that guy who drove his truck into a, a, a group of, uh, a, a, of tourists and, 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 and locals just trying to enjoy their lives in, in Barcelona the other day. And I will always hate people like that. I have no tolerance for them. I have no sympathy for them. I will not turn the other cheek for them. And I will not love my enemy. I will not love my enemy. I will hate my enemy. So I don't buy this tolerance, you know, that, that we should, we should uh, have no tolerance for hate. Some people need to be hated. Th those people who marched in Charlottesville with Nazi slogans... Let me tell you, I hate you guys. And Antifa, the, 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 the leftist group that uh, goes around the country attacking people who they disagree with and beating them up and using pepper spray on them, I hate you guys. And it's when we, when we have the, 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 the stomach and the, and the spine to identify people we hate and rationally defend our position that is, only, that is when we will resurrect America. I mean, the founding fathers hated the king, and they offended him, and they revolted against him, and they shot people. I don't buy this, I guess, this Christian idea of turning the other cheek and loving your enemy. I don't love my enemy, never will, never have. Um, you know, I've been in a war in, in, in Israel. I, I, I know what it's like to, to see people. You know, to see people, you know, die in a war. I hate people who attack my values. I hate people who want to destroy my country. I hate people who want to destroy my values. I'm not, I'm not a turn the other cheek kind of guy. 
and I'm not, a patriot. If patriotism just means opening my heart or loving America because it's this geography. I'm a patriot only to the extent that this country lives up to its founding principle, only to the extent that this country protects individual rights, only to the extent that this country is a country that, you know, that is individualist, that protects the individual, that values the individual. But this collectivist garbage coming out of the president of the United States' mouth does not, does not encourage me to be patriotic. Really? I'm supposed to feel any time an American is feeling pain? No, I'm not. I love this country. I emigrated to this country because I love this country because this country represents freedom. It represents individualism. It represents individual rights, and it was founded to protect those rights. That's the extent to which I love it, to the extent this country becomes socialist, to the extent this country becomes statist, to the extent this country becomes collectivist. I will fight it. All right. We come back. We'll talk more about why we're losing this battle for America, why America is slipping away, or at least this idea of America is slipping away, slipping away so much that our president doesn't even advocate for it, and the people who support the president don't advocate for it, and very few people out there know what America really is. All right, you're listening to Iran Brook filling in for Pelka on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be back right after this. Lamp. Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. All right, you're listening. You're on Brooke filling in for Mike Opelka uh, today through Thursday. And, and just to make it clear, guys, I, I don't walk around hating everybody all the time, but hate is appropriate. Hate is appropriate. I actually am a big believer in love. Uh, loving yourself first and foremost, loving your own life, and then figuring out what are the most important values that are make your life the best life that it can be, living so you can live the best that you can live and um, and loving those values, loving those things. And I love this country and I love this country because it is the best country for my life. It's the country where I can still make the most of my life. It's the country where I have chosen to fight the battle for freedom because I think it's the country with the most upside potential. We were free. We come from a history of great fighters for freedom. We come, f we come from... From, from the founders of this country who really believed and understood what freedom stands for. And I still believe that we can resurrect. We can resurrect and, in a sense, reinvent those ideas and make them even more solid now than before. So, um, no, it, life is about loving, but not your enemies. <laughs> them I still hate. All right, I, I want to talk about, uh, you know, we're talking about... Um, uh, this false sense of patriotism that I think the president projects, this uh, false sense of uh, collectivism that I think now is embedded in our culture and more and more and more we get a sense of it, so much statism around. And all of this, I think, is a consequence of the fact that the statists have been winning against the founders, against the individualists in American history for the last, for the last 100 plus years. And, and to put it in the perspective of left and right, basically the left is winning. And, and you can think about it this way. Um, when FDR uh, passed uh, all of his um, agenda, right, the New Deal, the New Deal that FDR passed, regulation of finance, complete regulation, every aspect of the financial industry, uh, regulation of employment, labor laws, Social Security, the, the establishment for the first time in American history at the federal level of a welfare state. Massive, massive intervention in the economy, the building of, of, of big projects by the government and on a scale that the government had never done before. Republicans fought him. Republicans stood up against him and fought every single thing that he did. Indeed, the Supreme Court fought him until he basically threatened to, to wipe them out, to stack the court. Uh, and, and then they basically folded and accepted his view of the Constitution. 
And, and Republicans always said during the 30s, when we get into power, we will reverse everything that FDR did. And then they got into power, and they didn't. They embraced everything FDR did. They're the biggest supporters of public projects. Look at the infrastructure bill that Trump wants to foist upon us. Social Security? They don't want to do away with Social Security. They're, they're big proponents of Social Security. We want to defend Social Security, say the Republicans. Deregulation? Eh, well, maybe sometimes, you know, once in a while they'll deregulate a little bit. But nothing systematic, nothing on principle. No, Republicans today are basically have accepted FDR as a hero. Most Republicans today consider FDR a great American president. Not like Republicans at the time who were opposed to him, who fought against him, who, who, who thought he was anti-American and a disaster. No, today he's considered a hero among Republicans. When Johnson then in the 1960s Two minutes. passed the Great Society, the massive expansion of the welfare state, war on poverty, Medicare, Medicaid, Republicans opposed it, argued against it. You should listen to Ronald Reagan's speech from 1964 we attacks Medicare. And as they said, as soon as we get into power, we're going to undo all this. Did they? No. No. As soon as they got into power, they reinforced all of it. And today, nobody challenges the great society. Republicans are way to the left of where they used to be. Throughout, in terms of everything with regard to, 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 to economic issues, to the role of government. Republicans today believe in a robust role for government. We've got a president who wants to regulate and control trade, wants to tell CEOs who to hire and who to fire and when to hire and where to fire, where to locate their plants. Republicans are not, as I mentioned earlier, a capitalist party. They have drifted way to the left on all those issues. And the question is why? Why does the left keep winning? Why is the left dominating the intellectual discussion, the intellectual landscape. Why do Republicans today look like Democrats of the past? 30. And uh, so we're going to take a break in a few seconds, and that's really what we're going to talk about in, uh, in the next part of the show. Why is the right, the, 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 the right of old keep losing to the left, and why are the right and left today indistinguishable 10. in many respects? All right. We're coming up to a break. You're listening to Ron Brook, filling four, in from Mike Opelka three, on the Blue Radio Network. One. Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. All right, this is Yaron Brook filling in for Mike Opelka. You can follow me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. Just put in my name, Yaron, Y A R O N, Brook, B R O O K. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there and, and lots more content. I also have a, a show here on The Blaze every Sunday uh, from 2 to 4 Eastern time. I, I hope uh, you start listening there as well. Uh, hopefully you're intrigued. All right, we're talking about why the left is winning. And let me, let me clarify. It's not that I think the left is winning because they gain the most votes. So they, obviously they don't. They, they win the elections. Obviously they don't. It's because they dictate the terms of debate. They have moved the entire political spectrum to the left. Today's Republicans are Democrats of the past. There is no capitalist party in America today. Everything is to the left. Everything has shifted. And the only response Republicans have had recently to the left's agenda is to adopt their collectivism, to adopt their identity politics, and some have gone out to the fringe right and, and, and to the alt-right and adopted the same kind of racist identity politics that the left, the radical, the, the, the fringe left has embraced. All right? So, no, everything we talk about today is on the left's terms. I mean, think about it for yourself. How many of you think that, that the financial crisis was caused by Wall Street? I mean, a majority, an overwhelming majority of Americans believe that. That is a leftist story. That is not reality. Right? How many of you we think in America today that race is really, really important, that racial characteristics 
are really, really important to who you are. That is a leftist idea and an alt-right idea. But the alt-right and the alt-left, not much difference there. In, in, in so many respects, you know, if we leave business alone, they will, you know, they will poison us and they will destroy us. And we have to regulate drug companies. And now, now we're getting more and more um, this idea we have to regulate the Internet and we have to, we have to control uh, Google. And uh, those are all, those are not ideas of a pro-capitalist party. And yet they are prevalent. Everything, the whole political map has shifted to the left. There's no discussion of actually establishing freedom. Freedom in America. All right, before I go on on that discussion, we have Malachi, I think. Malachi, I'm pronouncing that right, from Chicago. Uh, hi, Malachi. What's up? I'm enjoying the discussion, Your Honor. I wanted to know how, how do you respond to the criticism about being a globalist? Uh, and, and that, you know, is a critique of, of sure. many, I suppose, on the right now. I mean, it, uh, especially when it comes to not only issues about immigration, but also trade. I mean, isn't this something that the right kind of has going for it now is that, you know, it's been so passive. And now the right is kind of getting tough and cracking down on neocons and globalists. Uh, such as yourself. Yeah, well, let's let's unpack that. Let's let's identify what globalism is. Um, and it doesn't really mean anything would, would be my start-off point, right? What does globalism actually mean? It means, for some people, a world government, control over the United States from other nations, loss of sovereignty, the placing of the world, people all over the world, as the thing to be, uh, to be loyal to versus your own state. It also means free trade, and, and relatively open immigration. But that is a package deal. The two have nothing to do with one another. I, for example, am uh, for free trade, and I'm for much more immigration than we have today. And I'm against world government, and I'm against other countries telling our government what they can and cannot do. I'm against of looking at the world from the perspective of countries and world governments and so on. My whole approach is to look at the world from the individual up, not from the state down. So globalism is used, it's thrown about left and right all over the place to describe what? To describe people who want to control my life in the name of the planet or something? Then it's a bad thing to describe people who believe in free trade and allowing individuals to pursue their own life and their own happiness uh, without coercion? I'm all for people like that. So it's a meaningless term. I hate the term. It's meaningless. And I certainly am not a globalist, but I am for free trade. And I am for, um, for immigration. All right. So thanks, uh, Malachi. Great name, by the way. I don't know how you came up with that one. Uh, thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Uh, We've got Douglas from Chicago wants to talk about Jerry Lewis. I'm, I'm going to hold off on that while I keep the discussion going. Um, Jerry Lewis is a little in, in, out, of, out, of, uh, out of the topics I wanted to cover today. All right. So why is it drifting leftward constantly? And I would say it's because the left has had the ideological high ground. The left is intellectual, the left is philosophical, the left has ideas. The right does not. The right has nothing to counter the ideas of the left. And let's, let's talk a little bit about what some of those ideas are. Right? The idea of, you know, fundamentally, you know, that much of the left, much of philosophy today, many of their philosophers out there, Many of the teachers teaching your kids are teaching them the reality. Reality is not real. There is no actual reality. It's you shape reality. It's, 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 it's your imagination. It's your emotions. It's, it's, there's no actual solid thing out there. Think about the consequences of that. How do we know what truth is? Well, the left tells us today we're in a post-truth era. You, you can't even debate ideas with people like that. 
But what is the right offer in response to that, to this postmodern, uh, you know, uh, leftist ideas that are driving the social justice warriors and are driving so much of the Antifa, and, but so much of the university professors, so many of, of, of the classes that your kids um, are, are taking in college are advocating that reality doesn't really exist, it's not really real, that you're just making it up, that your reality is guided by your nature as a black person or a white person, and therefore if you're white, you should have immediate guilt because you've been oppressing black people. I mean, all this garbage that is a complete rejection of facts, a complete rejection of reality because they don't believe in facts and reality. The world is completely subjective. Reality is completely subjective. It's up to you. Now, what does the right respond to that? Does the right have a theory of explaining how to understand the world, where truth comes from, where knowledge comes from? No. Most people on the right do not. Most intellectuals on the right either default to religion as the source of knowledge. And by the way, religion will never beat out philosophy. It has no ground to stand on. It, it relies on revelation, and revelation are not facts of reality, are not proof of anything, because you can't share a revelation. You can't, you know, revelations are just because you said so. That's not facts. That's not argument. That's not logic. That's not reason. Or pragmatism. The right is very fond of pragmatism. We'll do whatever works. Whatever works. No principles, no ideas, and no actual argument about the nature of reality. In that sense, pragmatism is just like the left. The left will also do whatever works. So you basically have no argument for reality, no argument for reason, no argument for facts given by the right. And if you can't make that argument, too many people attempt it by this idea of, hey, we'll just, we'll just adopt, and, and you can see it on American campuses today, we'll just adopt this identity politics, we'll just adopt this idea that whatever happens in my head, whatever my emotions are, whatever my leader tells me, because I don't trust my emotions, that's what the truth is going to be. And what you get is mindless, brutish young people, which is what we're seeing we're seeing so much of on American universities today. All right, we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, we'll come back and talk about why the left has a moral high ground, not only a, uh, an epistemological, philosophical high ground, but they also have the moral high ground. And until we challenge that, we will continue to lose. You're listening to, you're listening to Ron Brook on The Michael Pelka Show. You're listening to Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. Part of the next generation of talk radio on the Blaze Radio Network. So this is Yvonne Brook filling in for Mike Opelka today. Uh, I'll be doing this through Thursday. And, uh, you know, to understand what America is, I think it's valuable to understand where it came from. What was the founding of America really about? Which is just a bunch of, as some people would like to describe it, a bunch of white guys who are fed up with a king. What was the ideas that made America possible? America is an ideological revolution. America, at its founding, is the implementation of an idea in politics, in reality. It's not just, you know, defining a new country. America was a different country than any other country that had existed before. America is the first country in human history founded on a moral principle. That principle is individual rights. The idea that every one of us as an individual has a right, therefore is free, to pursue our own life, to live our lives as we see fit in pursuit of the rational values necessary to live. And rational is important. America is a country that comes at the pinnacle of the age of reason. It's not an accident. Reason. The founders admired reason. They understood that reason was our means for knowing the world, that reason was our means of gaining knowledge. 
and that if human beings were going to survive and thrive, they needed to be free to use their reason in order to achieve their values. But to the founders, reason was at the core of what it meant to be human. This country is the country of the enlightenment, of the age of reason, of the idea of science, discovery, knowledge, reality, the idea that we can know the world, that we can discover truth. And therefore, as individuals, as we discover truth as individuals, we must be free to express that truth. We must be left alone to apply that truth, to build businesses, to create stuff. And once you create it, it's yours because you created it. It's not the states. It's not the groups. It's not the collectives. It's not societies. It's not the kings. It's not the tribes. It's yours. Starting with your life and the things that you produce, they are yours. Nobody else has a claim against them. That is the genius of America. The idea of individual rights. The idea that individuals must use their reason freely to pursue the things necessary for them to live. So when you start a business and create something new, that is yours. And the only way to live is by producing, creating, building. So America is the idea of individualism combined with the idea that reason is our means of survival. Our basic means of survival is reason, to think, to identify truth and reality, to identify the facts of reality, to integrate them into new knowledge, and to apply that knowledge to our lives as individuals. America was the rejection of collectivism in all its different forms, all its different forms, from monarchy to tribalism to even to absolute democracy, where the majority gets to decide everything. That's why the founders established a constitutional Two republic minutes. to protect the smallest of all minorities, to protect the individual. So that is what America is. Those are the ideas that made it great. And yet, do you see anybody defending reason? Do you see anybody defending individualism? No, right or left. That's where the left has won. Today, the right and the left are both collectivists. Just the quote I gave you from Trump's speech is a great illustration of that. The right and left today are both anti-reason. There is no party that defends science and technology and, and, and human knowledge and, and the ability of the individual to use his own reason, to use his own mind to create a life for himself. No, the left believes you as an individual cannot make a life for yourself. You're completely dependent on government. You need government's help. The collective must support you, and you are part of this collective. There's a wholesale rejection, both on the left and on the right, of the ideas of the founding. The ideas of individualism and the idea that we must use and can use and have the ability to use 30. our minds in order to make the most of our own lives. That's why I don't consider myself on the right anymore. Right, left, they're all collectivists. They're all anti-reason. I consider myself an individualist. And in that sense, Ten. I'm opposed to both political parties today. All right. Five, four, to your run, three, to your book on the two, Parker show. one. Clear. Opelka.